السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ ان الحمد للہ حمد کثیر وسرۃ وسلام رسول اللہ وعلی علیہ وسب اجمعین اشد اللہ اللہ وحلہ اللہ شریق اللہ و اشد ون محمد عبد رسول و ختام الابین و رحمۃ العالمین و دعین اللہ وسرۃ منیر عمد I'm going to tell you tonight about my journey from where I once was as a former Christian youth minister to how I got to where I am now. Um, there's a lot of bumps in the road, you know, it seems pretty clear, yeah, you're a minister and now you're Muslim, you know, but there's, there's a little bit more to it, inshallah, so uh, just bear with me and uh, hopefully you'll get something out of it because the point is at the end is I want you to get the message behind the story because if I was traveling around the country just to tell my story then I would be wasting time. It's on YouTube. Anyone can go get it from anywhere in, in, in the world. Um, so inshallah, we're going to begin at the beginning. Uh, I was born and raised in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, I was born and raised in Greenville, South Carolina and I was uh, raised by my grandparents because at a very early age my mother had stepped out and my father was uh, working two jobs. So it was me and my grandparents. And my grandparents were uh, the traditional conservative southern Christian folk, as they say. Uh, they were uh, born in, they were uh, very, very conservative in their ideals and their ideologies, uh, in their ways. You know, you know as, as you hear about you know, be, people being set in their ways, that was my grandparents. Like, they, this, we did it this way, and this is the way you did it every single day, and that was it. Um, And we were very religious in the sense that we went to church on Sundays, we went to church Sunday evenings, uh, we went to church Wednesday. And in Christianity, that's considered very religious. Um, so, and it was not hard for us to go to church and it was not difficult for my grandmother to drag me to church every Sunday, which as a kid is what they had to do, because the church was two houses down from our house. Uh, there was two houses and then there was the church. So it was not hard for them to drag me every Sunday. And... I hated church as a kid because of the simple reason that, you know, uh, we were brought up uh, United Methodist. And Methodist is, for any of you know, it's very traditional. It's not like you think about like screaming and shouting in church and all that. No, you, you listen to the preacher, you sit, stand up and you sing, you sit back down, you listen to the preacher, you stand up and sing, you sit back down, listen to the preacher, and that's it. That's all that happens. Um, And the, and, and the pews as they call them, the chairs are made out of wood, they're hard, you get tired of sitting there, you're fumbling around playing with the money that my grandmother gave me to, to put in the offering plate, all of these things. That's what I remember from church as a, as a very small boy. Uh, but the thing that I do remember enjoying about church was um, Sunday school. Sunday school is what I got enjoyment from because went to Sunday school, you painted pictures, you know, of like Noah building the ark, you painted, you know, all these pictures of, the, of Moses building the Red Sea. You learn the stories of, of Moses uh, freeing... Uh, Uh, the children of Israel from Egypt, you learn the story about him splitting the Red Sea, you learn the story about Noah and the Ark, you learn the story about David and Goliath, you know, you learn all these beautiful stories in Sunday school. So this was basically as coming up, this is what I knew about Christianity, was the stories that I learned in Sunday school because I never listened to the preacher uh, during regular service. So that was the only thing I knew about Christianity. So coming up, this was how it was, it was just the norm and the conservatism in my house Just to give you an example, and uh, about the level of conservatism, is if let's talk about gender issues. Let's say when I became 12, 13, 14, and I started to actually, you know, uh, notice uh, females, and I actually didn't think they had diseases and wanted to run away from them every time I saw them. Uh, let's say I wanted to to to, to uh, have a girl over or something of this nature. It was so serious to my grandmother that I had to make an appointment with her, let her know this girl was coming to my house. Uh, had, she had, we had to sit in the formal living room, which in the south, I don't know if, how it is here, but you have the dining room, then you have the formal living room with all the nice stuff that you don't go in unless there's company over. And my grandmother either had to be sitting in the same room with us or in the kitchen where she could see directly in the room. I mean, this is just how it was in my house. Uh, and this is how my grandmother and grandfather were. They were very stern. They were very loving, but there were rules, and those rules were the way they were, and they did not change. Um, so this was my upbringing. And I would say at about the age of uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, more along the age 13, 14, I started going to the Saturday evening youth services at my church uh, that were for 12 and up. And 
the youth services were held in the gym and they were totally different than church. At the youth services you went, we played basketball, we played volleyball, we played dodgeball, we, you know, we played every kind of sport and we ate pizza and, and cake and candy, you know, all, all the stuff kids like to do. And at the end, uh, the, the youth minister, who happened to be uh, um, my catty corner neighbor across the, the street, when I was 14, he was 17, um, he was the youth minister, so he would sit us down and give us a 30 minute lecture about uh, Christianity about something about God doing you know he would give us a 30 minute sermon and then and that's how the youth services were and going to these youth services I, I met some other people who went to other youth services they invited me to young uh, young men for Christ and other in uh, other things that were going on in South Carolina and so I started to go to these different retreats and in and, and camping trips with them and so that is when I would say that I started to become a Christian uh, out of will. I became a Christian because I wanted to, not because it was something I was dragged to do. I started to actually uh, want to be Christian. This is something I wanted to do. I made my own choice and my own decision to do it. So when I turned uh, um, 15, I, I started going to high school. And when I was in a freshman in high school, my, my best friend who was the youth minister was a senior in high school. And I remember we, we had a very close bond because I, I, I had not had my license yet, so I used to ride with him to school every day. Uh, and it was a big deal for me to be able to ride to school with a senior, uh, especially since he had a, you know, a, a, a brand new, uh, or it was a brand new, but he had a restored 67 Mustang, which I've always been a fan of cars when I was a kid. So we, we had a very close bond and we were very good friends because both of our parents were very similar. They didn't let us do much. Um, so we, 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 we spent a lot of time with each other. And when I became a sophomore, he graduated and started to attend Bob Jones University. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell with anyone, but Bob Jones University is a very prestigious conservative Christian college in South Carolina. Uh, it's probably the most conservative college I've ever seen uh, because uh, the Moody Institute is known as one of the most famous in this country since Chicago. But Bob Jones is conservative to the point to where when it comes to men and women, like men and women are not allowed to get caught talking to each other in a room alone if they're not married, holding hands on campus. The men had to wear uh, button-up shirts or polo shirts tucked in with slacks or jeans. The women had to wear skirts, uh, no jeans, skirts that came down to the ankle and a shirt that came to the wrist. And this, this, is, this was part of the guidelines for Bob Jones University. You know, you didn't party, you didn't, you didn't drink, you didn't, you, there was none of this that happened at Bob Jones University. Um, and he started going there and his major was uh, textual criticism. And um, textual criticism probably doesn't ring a bell with anyone and to explain it in detail would probably take an entire, another entire lecture. But just to give you a, a, a brief synopsis of what is uh, um, textual criticism, a textual critic takes the ancient manuscripts of the Bible, the pieces of parchment that were found all over the world, and he has to learn uh, Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, Latin, you know, these languages that these parchments have been found in. And he has to take these scriptures and try to find out where they came from, uh, why there are variations in the many different versions of the same parchment. Let's say you have Matthew chapter 1 from the Bible. There might be 5,000 different variant readings of Matthew chapter 1 in six languages. And so he has to be able to take all these and sift through them, try to find out why there's so many variations of the readings, and then determine which one is the original. Um, and that's not as easy a task as it seems. You could figure, you know, which one of the oldest is probably a more original, which is not the case since there are no originals. Uh, you might have one parchment that is the oldest parchment of the, of, the, of the group, but it might be a copy of 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 a copy with, with laden with mistakes. And then you might have the newest par parchment in the, in the series that might be a once over copy from an original or a twice over second copy from an original. Therefore, it would make the newer parchment more original than the older one. So it's, it's not a very easy field uh, to go into. And he started studying textual criticism and being that I was his best friend, I started studying textual criticism. Whenever he was, you know, doing his homework or research papers, you know, I was right there with him. Whenever he did a homework, he would always let me read it. Or when he finished his papers, he would give them to me. I would, he, I, he would pass down all of his papers to me. I would, every textbook, when he was done with it, he would give it to me. I started to learn a little bit of Greek, uh, a little bit of Hebrew. Um, so I, I became, you know, started to become a layman's textual critic. And I applied to Bob Jones University in my sophomore year because it's a, it was a three-year waiting uh, process for Bob Jones. And when I turned uh, 16, almost 17, 
he, my friend came to me one day and he asked me a question that, that I had never really even pondered upon. He, he asked me, he said, have you ever read the Bible? And I said, uh, no, in church. I mean, yeah, we've all read the Bible in church. You know, your parents make you open it up and look at it. And at the Bible studies that I went to, Young Men for Christ, we did have Bible studies. And we'd read a few passages and talk for two hours about those few passages. But he's like, no, 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 have you ever read it? You know, like you read a book beginning to end. I said, no, I've never, I don't know anybody that's read, nobody that I knew had ever read it, beginning Genesis 1, 1 to the end. He said, so, but this is the inerrant word of God, as we are taught. This is our instructions on earth. Why haven't we read it? You know, why have we not read this book? And I said, you know, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and he gave me a challenge, well, it was basically a challenge for us both. He said, let us start with Genesis 1.1 1, 1, and let's read the Bible and let's see what God says to us. Because this is the inerrant word of God inspired to men for instructions for us. So let us see what God says to us. If God can talk to the preacher through this book, why can't he talk to me? I said, you're right. Uh, I said, that's very good. And I had a lot of time on my hands. Uh, I wasn't really allowed to do much uh, anyway after school. So I said, why not? Let's read the Bible. Um, I was somewhat nerdy as, as a 14, 15 year old, 16 year old. Um, so I, we started to read the Bible and we decided to go from Genesis 1-1. And what we tried to do, this was the attempt that we made, was to not think of anything that we'd ever heard about Christianity. But to open the Bible and let's say I just found this book in the desert and read it and see what it says to me. Let it talk to us. So we started Genesis 1-1. And we started reading through the Bible. You know, we, we did some of it together and most of it I did by myself uh, because I, I, I'm a very, very quick reader. So I, I, I decided to read a lot on my own. And as I was reading through the Bible, um, I started to notice the stories that I had heard in Sunday school. You know, you start reading Genesis, you read about Adam and Eve, we all know that story. Um, you start to read about uh, Deuteronomy, Exodus, you know, the stories of Moses, the story of, of Noah, the story of Lot and Abraham, and, and all these stories that I know. But I was surprisingly and astonishingly shocked by some of the stories that I read about these same people that I learned about in Sunday school. Um, just for instance, and, and this is a big testament to why... Allah kept sending us prophets and why Islam was sent as a complete and perfected deen with the Qur'an. If you read about Noah in the Bible, there is the story about Noah saving uh, uh, humanity from the flood with an ark and all of that. There is this in the Bible. There's other, another aspect to the story of Noah that, that not many people know about unless they actually take time to open a Bible. This will not be preached from any pulpit anywhere. Is that The, the Bible says that Noah was an alcoholic. This is the Bible's portrayal of Noah, or Nuh alayhi salam, that he was an alcoholic, he was a drunkard. This is the word used in the Bible, that he was a man given to alcohol. And <clears throat> I'm a psychology major, and my, my, my uh, field of specialty is mental illnesses, and, and alcoholism is one of those, is, is a mental illness. And I know from seeing alcoholism's effect on one of my close uh, friend's parents, uh, I know that someone who is truly addicted to alcohol, and if Noah lived for so long addicted to alcohol, he was seriously addicted to alcohol. Um, it is hard for someone addicted to alcohol to hold down a 9 to 5 job working at McDonald's flipping hamburgers. Much less construct an ark to save humanity from a flood that's never happened. So that stopped me for a moment in my tracks. And I said, Noah was an alcoholic. You know, and... and it, it bothered me for a minute because I said, I, you know, things started popping in my mind like, if Noah was a drunkard, how did he know God was talking to him? Because, you know, I've seen some people, they're alcoholics, you know, <laughs> you were just asleep in my dog's food bowl the other night drooling and now you're telling me you were talking to God last night. You know, did this, did, you know, to rationally that would not make sense to me. That's like, you know, an alcoholic on the street coming to you and tell you God's talking to him. You know, he has no, th this would give this man no validity. The, the, this man has no validity with anyone. So, I didn't pay it too much attention. It caught me. But I said, you know what? I'm going to keep going. Because there's one thing that you don't do in Christianity. And I'll tell you what it, was, it is in a minute when I started doing it. Um, then I came across the story of Lot. Or Lut alayhi salam. And we all know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in, in these stories. But there's a, another very twisted story in the Bible about Lot and his daughters. There's a story of Lot and his daughters 
uh, uh, in, in, in the Bible that says his daughters got him drunk one night and seduced him and committed incest with him. This is the Bible, this is one of the Bible portrayals of the prophets of God. The person who saved, saved, uh, 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 or, or saved his family from Sodom and Gomorrah. This is the story that is in the Bible. So I'm catching myself again like, oh, this is becoming a really uh, bad habit that I'm seeing. This is becoming a bad recurrence that I'm seeing over and over again in this Bible. So, you know, after that I started, you know, speeding through some of the other mumbo jumbo to get to more of these prophet stories. And I got to the story, there, there, there are others, and there are some stories in the Bible that are not PG rated, period. They're not rated for talking anywhere. You know, you would need a, 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 an 18 and up ID card to be able for me to even tell you these stories. So I, the one that tre intrigued me, the, uh, that caught my attention the most, was of my most beloved story in the Bible, and that was of David and Goliath. Uh, that was my most intriguing story to me because not only was, you know, it said that in the Bible that David was a very small man and Goliath was a very big man, and that was appealing to me because I was old, I've always been very short, and as a kid I was really short. So, you know, I said, uh, this was a very beautiful story to me just in its prose and in, and in its concept of overcoming. And so I started to read about David. And there are very beautiful stories about David in the Bible. There are indeed. But there is one story about David in the Bible that shocked me to my core. And it's a story about three people. There's three people in, in, in this drama. David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. And it says that David saw, uh, saw this woman named Bathsheba. And she was one of the most beautiful women of her time. Uh, and she happened to be married to one of the commanders of his army named Uriah. But David on this day decided that he was not able to resist his temptation uh, to be with this woman Bathsheba, so he did. Uh, and he committed adultery with her. And knowing that he did this, he, the, the, the way that he decided to cover it up was he sent a letter to the generals of his army saying that when the battle was fierce, for everyone to pull back and abandon Uriah. Uh, so that he would be killed, and when he dies, then he could have Bathsheba, no harm, no foul. So, David went from being the slayer of Goliath, the hero for man, to uh, an adulterer, a, a, a plotter, and a murderer. And so, this is when I really caught myself and said, hold on now. Something's wrong here, something's got to give. I said, because to me, God's prophets in my mind were people of example, people who I could follow as an example, someone who was supposed to be the best of us, so that we could follow them and emulate them. And I'm, they're turning out to be worse than some of the people that you see on America's Most Wanted. David is somebody that, if I only knew this about him from the Bible, I see him coming down the street, I'm going the other way and calling 911, because he has to have a warrant out on him for something. This is what I'm thinking in my mind, this man is not an honorable man at all. He, he, okay, he killed Goliath, yeah, but he killed this other guy named Uriah to be able to commit adultery with his wife. So I, 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 did, I committed the cardinal sin in Christianity. I started asking questions. Um, this is the one thing you do not do in Christianity is you don't ask questions, especially not about issues like this. Um, so I went to my pastor and I started asking questions. You know, what, what's going on here? You know, pastor, there's, there's a, a very bad recurring a habit about these men in the Bible. What is, what is the deal here? And I remember he told me the same thing that I, almost every pastor or every evangelist or anyone I talked to about this, same, same, same answer, almost like it was programmed. They would put their hand on my shoulder and say, Brother Joshua, don't let a little bit of knowledge wreck your faith. Because you're not justified by knowledge, you're justified by faith. Uh, and they would quote me verses like, lean not on understanding, you know, Paul's, we're justified by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, this is all, they would quote this whole line of thing to me like it was already pre-programmed, that they, like they programmed in pastor school that people are going to ask you questions and here's the answer. Um, so, you know, I said to myself, you know, I don't know, pastor, you know, this just seems kind of odd. He said, let me tell you something. Uh, what you're reading is the Old Testament referring to God's covenant with the children of Israel. Uh, and they were a different people, a very stubborn, crazy people. Uh, so, why don't you move on to the New Testament? Uh, in the New Testament, you'll find the new covenant they were under with Jesus Christ, and I promise you things will change and be better. I said, okay, perfect. 
So I read all the, went ahead and finished and got to Malachi and then started with the New Testament. So I, you know, I opened the New Testament and I said, here we go. You know, let's start all over again. But there were a few things that I had learned from the Old Testament that, that, that I wanted to keep in mind when I started to read the New Testament. I learned, number one, that God was one in a unique sense. This is what I learned from the Old Testament, that God was one in a singular, unique sense sense. This is over and over and over and over very clearly in the Bible. God's nature is one. This is so clear through the Old Testament and that he was very jealous about his worship. And every single time the children of Israel would turn to something else other than him, he would punish them and restrict their lifestyle. This is something that I learned. And it kind of, sim the similitude to me with how God dealt with the children of Israel was and I hate to use this stark, contra uh, this stark contrast, but it's almost as if one of uh, one of us went out, God forbid, I hope not. And let's say we went out here and, and robbed a bank. You rob a bank, you're going to jail for a long time. And every day when you wake up, do you think that that jail is going to look like the 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 Hilton at LAX? No, I I, I doubt it. It's probably dark, cold, bad food, orange jumpsuits. Not nice people, the whole nine yards. And the reason why this is, and I know this now from studying psychology, is that this is supposed to be a stark reminder every single day when this person wakes up that you are in jail. This is supposed to remind them every single day you're in jail because you committed a crime. And we run this, not you. This is the message that is being portrayed to this person in jail. So when the children of Israel kept rebelling against God, he restricted their lifestyle. If you study Judaic law now, it is some of the most strict religious law you can find. All of the good things that we enjoy as Muslims, even when it comes to dietary laws, like the good parts of the meat that we are allowed to eat, they can't have these things. These are things that are restricted from them. Why? Because God, Allah wanted to remind them every day that I am Allah. I am your God. You will worship me. I run this. Not you. And I understood this from reading the Old Testament. This is a concept I had come across. So I started with the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And one other thing that I did when I started to read the Bible was, if you go to Barnes & Noble, let's say you go to Barnes & Noble and you take a book off the shelf, what is usually the first thing you look at? The title. Then the next thing, the author. You want to know the title and the author. What is the name of the book? Who wrote it? Um, and if you do this test with every single uh, um, book of the Bible, you get a title and no author, author unknown, or author is, uh, uh, appears to be so-and-so, or we derive that so-and-so possibly written this, you know, like let's just say for Exodus, they say Moses wrote Exodus, uh, which if you read some of, Mo uh, of Exodus, he couldn't have written all of Exodus, uh, because the last part of Exodus is Moses' death, burial, and Joshua taking over the children of Israel, and now unless Moses was a sure indeed prophet that was able to write things after he died, then he did not write these things. And so when you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I wanted to know Matthew who? Mark who? Luke who? John who? Because it's called the gospel according to Matthew. The bad thing is that no one knows. No one knows because no one pinned their name down to these things. No, no Bible scholar in his right mind will tell you that we know for sure Matthew so-and-so wrote this, Mark so-and-so wrote this, Luke so-and-so wrote this, John so-and-so wrote this. It's, not, it's, it's factual information that we do not know who wrote these. So I was intrigued. I'm like, hmm, that doesn't, you know, why would somebody write this book that's supposed to be passed down over generations and people are supposed to, this is the inspired word of God to guide mankind and nobody decided to write, pin down who wrote it. But anyway, I started to read it and I started to notice things about the teachings of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they were not what I had learned in church. Uh, when Jesus spoke, he spoke of the nature of God. And when he spoke of the nature of God, it was the same nature of God that I found in the Old Testament. Jesus said uh, uh, many times that God is one. God is unique. He, he would even quote from the Hebrew scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is but one. Uh, when he was asked what is the greatest commandment, or the, he was asked the greatest commandment, he said the greatest commandment, and every Muslim should understand these two concepts, this should be nothing new to you. Uh, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength, and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said the rest hang on these two, which we know ha we, in Islam we have rights of the creator and rights of the creation. Uh, so this was the concept that he was teaching. And 
he even was he even said in 1 John 5 and 17 and this was more clear to me than anyone else anything else can be this is life eternal that they may know you the only true god the only true god and Jesus Christ whom you have sent and when you look at that in the greek and the aramaic it is almost exactly to a t of la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah now that i know arabic and have understood that very same similar statements yes indeed there were some implicit statements uh, about that you could implicitly, if you took them and separated them from everything else, you could maybe derive that Jesus was trying to claim some divinity or, or something for himself. But I also know from doing psychology, and I did a little bit of law too, that an implicit statement cannot override an explicit statement. An explicit statement always takes precedence. So if Jesus said, God is one, and he anagorically may have alluded to God being more than one, then the clear statement overrides that each and every single time. Um, so this is what I found through the, through the New Testament. And I also found that Jesus taught salvation. But his salvation that he taught was obeying God and following the commandments. This was his mode of salvation. One man asked him, good master, tell me how I, in I can in inherit the etern uh, uh, eternal life. He said, follow the commandments. Follow the commandments. He even, in Matthew, was so seer, sincere about it. He said, whosoever shall follow the least of these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall break the least of these commandments and teach men to do so shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. So this I understood very clearly that Jesus taught the same nature of God that was in the Old Testament. He taught that the, the salvation lied in worshiping God and following the commandments. This I understood. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were very clear about this. You know, there were other things, the only begotten son, you know, but these things were not in red letters, so I did not give them as much weight as what I did to the actual words that Jesus Christ was saying out of his own mouth. Um, so, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All of it was saying the same to me, I said, but, and I, I was thinking to myself, this is not what I was taught about Christianity. You know, you're taught that God is one in three, three in one, you know, one, one, one equals three, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus died on your cross to so forgive your sin. You know, and there was another thing that I noticed from the Old Testament, and this is a, a beautiful lesson to Muslims because you're asked this all the time, uh, especially when it comes to da'wah. And it, I never put two and two together uh, until I learned Islam and then read the Bible one more time. Is I wanted to know why the Jews wanted to crucify Jesus so bad. Why so bad? They, they could have just mobbed him anywhere and killed him on the street. He didn't, he, it's not like he had clans like the Arabs that would have come and, and backed him up. I said, why didn't they just kill him? You know, why were they so strict and sincere to tell Pontius Pilate, you got to kill him and you need to sanction it. We can't do it, but you need to sanction it to kill him. And now I understand it, was that Jesus had a mission and, and that mission uh, was to share God with the world. And... Paul even kind of tells on himself uh, in his book of Galatians as to why Jesus was, uh, was meant to be crucified or the Jews wanted to crucify him. Paul said that the, the crucifixion is the stumbling block for the Jews. And he explained in Galatians uh, that Jesus Christ, and this is how he tried to round about explain it, was cursed for us to remove us from the curse of Allah by taking this curse upon us for it is written, and he quoted the Old Testament, everything that hangeth on a tree is cursed. So I went back and studied the Old Testament and Judaic law, and I realized that people who were crucified, that was considered a curse upon them. You had to do something pretty serious to, to get crucifixion, because uh, it, it was considered, considered a curse from God. It was part of their law that when someone is crucified, that person is cursed. So wherever they buried these criminals, uh, like in the, in the graveyards in, 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 uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem, in, in Palestine, where they buried these criminals that were crucified, this was considered cursed ground. This was considered ground that you didn't go on and you, didn't, you did nothing here because these people are cursed by God. So I started to put two and two together. That it's not that they wanted to kill Jesus because they could have just killed him. They wanted to disprove who he was. This was their point, was to disprove who this man was. He said he's the Messiah. They wanted to disprove it. And they knew, if you can crucify Jesus, he can't be the Messiah. He cannot be our Messiah if you can crucify him. And even if he is, if we can still force our crucifixion on him, then, then, then that will detriment his message. 
So they understood this and knew this and this is why they wanted to crucify him. And this is exactly why Allah saved him from it. This, because everyone asks you, why did Allah save him from the crucifixion? Because you cannot crucify, that was part of his law that he came to fulfill, that he could not be cursed according to this law. He said, I have come to fulfill the law. To fulfill it, therefore he couldn't be cursed according to it. And this is why he went to the Garden of Gethsemane and asked God to remove this from him. Because he knew how detrimental this was to his message of crucifixion. So, I began to see all of these things. So I, I, and I started to read, I got to the book of Acts. And started to read the writings of uh, Paul the Apostle. And things went from this to this. It went from one way to another way. It went completely flipped, turned around. The entire teachings went from f obeying God, worshipping God, following the law, to worshipping Jesus Christ and abolishing the law completely. Uh, Paul even wrote to the Galatians, Oh you foolish Galatians, why are you still following this cursed law? Jesus Christ came as a curse to remove us from the affliction of this curse. Um, so I said to myself, but Jesus just said a few books before this, that whosoever shall break the least of these commandments and teach men to do so, shall be the least in the kingdom of heaven. And here you go, Paul preaching this gospel to, 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 to abolish the law. So I, I even asked, what is going on here? So I started asking my pastor, and my pastor said, now you're getting into deep water. You know, now you're starting to question the New Testament. You really, got, you really have some issues. You know, they even thought that I might be, you know, possessed and all kinds of things. Um, so, I had a very big conflict going on inside of me. And, and my friend took me to his, um, his uh, uh, um, textual critic uh, uh, teacher, his professor. And what this man told me probably wrecked my faith in Christianity. And I, I, I always say I doubt he would be very happy uh, me traveling around the world telling people that a, a, a Christian professor from Bob Jones University wrecked my faith in Christianity. Um, but he did. Because what I asked him was what happened to all these contradictions. You know, in the, in the Old Testament there are many contradictions. If you study Hebrew language you'll understand that when you read some of the Old Testament or the Torah, that there are some parts of the Torah that you can see is the most beautiful Arabic that you can see, just I mean, the most beautiful Hebrew that you can see just like when you read Air, uh, uh, the Quran. It's very beautiful Hebrew. And then two chapters later you'll see Hebrew that looks like a broken three-year-old who is, is trying to scribble some Hebrew down. It looks very colloquial, very dialectic. You can tell it's not the same person speaking. So I started to, I went and asked him about all this stuff I saw. <clears throat> and he told me, he said, um, what you have is a book written by men over centuries and centuries and eons and eons. And he says, and this book started as an original that was copied and copied and copied and somebody added a mistake and somebody came behind him and corrected that mistake and added two of his own. Someone came and copied it and skipped a line and added a line where it wasn't supposed to be. And then someone else came and copied it and took it to his country and in order for it to uh, fit well with the doctrine they were teaching, he would cross out a dot here or, or cross out a word here or change a word here so that it would fit with, the, with the, the theological ideas of this part of the world. And he said, and after all these years, you have a book now that is compiled from all of this written by the hands of men that still have men's fingerprints left on it. And that's what you have. You have an imperfer, per, uh, imperfect book that is only perfected through faith. This is exactly what he told me, that this book is perfected through faith. You cannot perfect it textually. It's not a textually perfect book. Those who believe in it, believe in it by faith. And so I said, here we go again with this faith thing. You know, I said, God gave me a brain for a reason. Uh, if he did not want me to use it, he would remove this reason and logic part of my brain out and replace it with more faith. So, you know, and I was of the opinion, though, you know, as the saying goes, my, my grandmother didn't raise a fool. I'm no fool. I, you know, I said, I can't, I can't believe in this. You know, I mean, this, this book I've been taught is the inerrant word of God, and you're just telling me that it's a book of errors that's only perfect through faith. That's like me taking... Uh, a 1982 Datsun all beat up and saying, say, if you believe it's a really, it can be a Mercedes. If you believe. <laughs> you know, that, that would make no sense. You can't take a car to the car dealership and say that. No, no, if you really believe it, if you look at it right, it's a Mercedes. So I said, no, you know, this, this is a, an, a, a book full of errors. And God's religion is perfect. If God has a religion, it's perfect. If He has a book, it has to be perfect because He is perfect. So I left Christianity completely. And, um, I decided that 
I was, you know, I, I, I had learned some concepts from the Bible. God was one. You couldn't fool me of that. You know, I, I had also concepted that there should be nobody standing between me and God because He created me without permission from anyone. Therefore, I don't need to be taking permission from someone uh, to go to Him. If I had to be forgiven for something, it should come from Him because on the Day of Judgment, it's going to be me and Him alone. Um, and I didn't know about God's prophets yet. You know, I, I had my 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 doubts and persuasions about that <clears throat> so I decided to start searching other religions I went back to Judaism I studied Judaism I found the same thing that Jesus taught about spiritual two spiritual Jews that leave the law and laws Jews that were so caught up in the law that they left no room for spirituality I studied Buddhism uh, Hinduism uh, Taoism Confucianism Wiccan Bushido you know I, everything I could get my hands on every type of ism or religion I, I, I studied it but there was one Littman's test that I used for every religion. And when I saw it, whenever I met them, or the people, or whatever about this religion, I would always ask them, do you have a book? Do you have a book? Because another thing I had come to the conclusion of is that if your religion is true, you should be able to ha tangibly hand me something and show me that this religion is true. Give me something that I can see. I don't want to hear that faith stuff anymore. <laughs> I heard that all my life. And it look where it got me. It got me thinking I'm driving a Mercedes running around in 1982 beat up Datsun. <laughs> I said, no, you, you have to show me. And I, so I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the Torah. I read the scrolls of Tao. You know, I, I read the, the, the code of the Bushido. I read the Wiccan book of spirits and spells and all that other magic stuff they have. And I read all of these things and I found something very congruent with all of it was that there were very same philosophies and teachings in all of these major religious books. Uh, they all talked about God and His nature. Uh, most of them alluded to the fact that God is one and that God sends messengers to us and people to us to teach us. But they were filled with a whole bunch of, of, of garbage to be, to be honest with you that I couldn't logically, rationally believe. Um, so at about the age of 17, just about the time, about 17, um, 17 and a half, uh, I, I gave up my search for uh, God. And I became kind of angry with God because I said, here I am looking for you and I can't find you and it doesn't look like you're giving me any help. And I don't know how many of you know, but for a 17 year old is frustrated with God and the world, there's a lot of trouble he can get into. There's a lot of things he can do uh, to put himself in predicaments uh, when he's frustrated the world and, and had come to the conception that you know, if there's a God that exists, then He doesn't really care about me. You know, that's a kind of a dangerous young man. Um, so I started doing the whole partying, getting in trouble, um, uh, going to parties, drinking underage, all of this stuff I started doing. You know, I, I'm a perfectionist at heart. Uh, so when I was a Christian, I tried to be a, 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 the best one I could. If I was going to switch to being uh, any other religion, then I was going to do that 100%. So you better believe when I went after the dunya, I, I did that 100%. Um, and, you know, I was a martial artist uh, since I was 15 years old. And uh, even though it was only two years, you know, two years at 17, you think, you know, you're Bruce Lee. Uh, so I got into a lot of fights, uh, got kicked out of school, had to go to another school, got in one fight, got arrested for a fight. You know, and, and there were a couple incidences that stopped this downward spiral because I was on a very, very quick downward spiral. That would, And I believe if I would have continued on that downward spiral, I would probably end up hurting someone, killing someone, or them hurting or killing me. Um, and there were two incidents that brought that to an abrupt stop, like pulling the emergency brake. And the first one was a car accident that I was in. Um, my friend and I <clears throat> were on the way back from Clemson University um, from, a, from a frat party. And we were driving up 385 in South Carolina. And we were both uh, highly intoxicated. And... I decided that night that I, he was driving, I decided to put my seatbelt on uh, for the only reason that I kept falling over when I fell asleep without the seatbelt on. It, because I didn't really believe in the seatbelt thing because I, I said if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. You know, that was the conception that I come up with. That if, you know, if it's time for me to die, it's time for me to die. I didn't believe in the whole tying your camel thing. Uh, so I put on my seatbelt and I fell asleep. And the next thing I know, I remember waking up with the car shaking. And I woke up to, to grab my friend because I thought maybe he had fallen asleep. But when I woke up, the only thing I saw was the tree line and then the pavement coming right at my face. <clears throat> and the window smashing and the car flipping the whole nine yards and us landing in a ditch. And I remember getting out of the car. That was the first thing I thought. 
you know, I, 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 number one, I couldn't believe that, you know, you don't really think about, oh, you're a light. No, you just move. I jumped out of the car and realized that I had jumped out of the back of the car that wasn't there anymore. Uh, it was still in the median on the other side of the highway, and the front part of the car was, was over in the ditch. And I drug my friend out, <clears throat> who was knocked unconscious, <clears throat> and pulled him over the side of the road. I had no injuries. I looked at myself trying to find what's missing, and there was nothing but a, a, a piece of glass stuck in my arm that I pulled out. And it just so happened that a state trooper was passing the other way uh, because he turned around and came back. And uh, when he came back, he, you know, he asked what had happened. And the first thing he asked me was, did you see what happened? Because there was other people who had pulled over. So I guess he thought that I was a bystander because I started to walk towards him. He's like, did you see what happened? You know, where are the people? I said, yeah, I, I, I really saw what happened. I was in the car. You know, and he was like, you know, as they say, like the, the color drained out of his face because he was shocked. He said, no, how were you in that car? You know, and uh, of course they took the hospital. My friend got arrested, uh, DUI. Um, but before he put us in the ambulance, uh, he, he was a man of God uh, because he looked at me and he told me, he said, young man, you sh better realize that you're on this earth tonight for a purpose. Uh, the only reason you're still alive is that God has a purpose for you. Uh, if not, you don't live through things like that. People without purpose, if you didn't have a purpose, then this night would have been your night. So you need to realize that. I said, this old man's out of his mind. You know, if, if God had been looking for me, he had the opportunity to get me a long time ago. So don't tell me about that God stuff now. Um, so I paid it no attention. And about a month later, three, four weeks later, my friend and I, same two, he's on crutches still. We decided to go to New York City. We decided to just take off, drive to New York City. We didn't tell our parents where we were going. I, I said I was sleeping in his house. He said he was sleeping in my house for the weekend. Um, so we drove to New York. And I, uh, in New York, I, I remember going to, to, to the ATM to get some money. <clears throat> and, and in New York, they have these uh, ATMs where you have to go in the little glass room to get your money at ATM. I don't know if they have that here or if any of you have been to New York. Now, alhamdulillah, you have to put your bank card in to go in there. But in 97, it was not like this. Uh, you went in, and it was almost like the game Mousetrap. Because you go in, take out your money, criminal comes right in behind you. There's nowhere for you to go. You know, there's, there's nowhere to run. So I went in, and I took my money out of the ATM. And I heard the door open behind me, you know, so I turned around, you know, I thought somebody was coming in behind me. And there was a man who put a gun to my face. And he must have really, 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 really needed this money. Because he didn't ask me anything. He didn't say a single word. I just remember looking at the gun in my face and him pulling the trigger. And it was a revolver. Um, and to this day, I'll never forget that image in my head of seeing that little little spindle turn and hearing that very distinct click uh, uh, of a revolver. And it was it, it probably could have been like a 32 snub nose gun like this, but when it was in my face, it looked like one of those like cannons that you see on the movies. <laughs> and I remember when when he pulled the trigger, uh, I didn't think anything. You don't think anything. It, it just blank. You just go into this like shock of blankness, uh, and then. A couple of seconds later, thankfully I had been doing martial arts, uh, and that might have helped me overcome the fight or flight syndrome, because all I could think was, go! You know, like, like myself, kicking myself, like, what are you doing? Go! So I, I bum rushed him, we went flying, he went flying, money went flying, gun went flying, and I took off and went to the hotel, and didn't say anything to anybody. We went back to South Carolina the next day, um, and I didn't say anything because we weren't supposed to be in New York. My grandfather would have killed me. If that guy didn't kill me, my grandfather would have took care of it. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't say anything until about a month or two later, you know, I kept having nightmares about this same incident. I kept having night terrors uh, from, from this incident. And so I told my grandmother about it. And she told me the same thing that the, uh, that the officer had told me. She said, you know, uh, you have to realize that God has a purpose for your life. You're here for a, a reason. There's no, people don't go through the things that you've been through and still walking on this earth without a reason. And you're pushing the limit. This is what she told me. You're pushing the limit, really. Um, God has something for you, and, and He wants you to get it, but you're pushing it. And she didn't tell me to go back to Christianity and study my Bible. The only thing she told me was that God has not went, ha hasn't gone anywhere. You just have not looked in the right place yet. Um, and so I decided to put myself back together. You know, uh, the, the car wreck... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the gun thing, the getting arrested for fighting, like all of that, like really, 
made me stop really quick and think, you know, that I need to get my, my, my stuff together. So I became somewhat, uh, I became an agnostic, uh, someone who believes, I, I believe in God with no form of religion. Um, I prayed to God on the floor on my hands and knees because this is how all the books of God, this is how the, 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 the Bible, uh, the Torah, the, the New Testament, the Bhagavad Gita, the, all of these scriptures that I ever read, they said that this is how the men of God prayed. And uh, it was during this time that I did read one book about Islam in the public library because I had never heard of Islam um, uh, uh, ever. Um, but I remember I was looking in the religious section in, in the library at, at, at school and there was a book about Islam. And uh, or it was in the library, the public library, and I remember it was some title like Why I'm Not a Muslim or, or some, you know, one of these titles that, that was. Uh, propagandistic against Islam, but I, I, I had no idea. So I just took the book and I read it, and I remember it said that Muslims, uh, M-O-S-L-E-M-S, -E and any of you knowing Arabic knows that's a very derogatory word. A Muslim is someone who oppresses someone else. That's a very quick sleight of the pen that was used in the past for a very real purpose. Um, it said that Muslims were people who uh, worshipped a moon god named, named Allah, uh, who lived in a box in the desert in Saudi Arabia, and uh, they were oppressive to women. I remember there was a whole chapter about how they could have four wives and as many as they want actually because they could marry two, divorce one, get three more, you know, this whole, you know. Um, and, it, and it said that, you know, uh, uh, I remember the, the, the one thing that really caught my attention was the whole uh, chapter on jihad where it said that Muslims were allowed to kill non-Muslims at any time, at any place, without discretion, and it was an honorable act, and not only would they go to heaven before it, but they would get 70 versions on the way. You know, so I closed the book on Islam, put it back on the shelf, and marked off Islam off my little list of religions, and said, thanks, but no thanks, and if I ever see a Muslim, I am out. Um, and I said, I'm pretty safe in Greenville, South Carolina, I had never seen a Muslim ever. So I said, you know, I don't have to worry about running into no Muslims, thank God. So, you know, I, 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 I started, you know, just worshiping, you know, I tried to just be a good person, you know, pray to God, ask Him for guidance, try to be a genuinely good person. Um, and I remember the, the, what changed is when I met a Muslim. I met a Muslim who I had met a couple of times at school. We had went to school together and I knew him, but I never knew that he was Muslim. And, and there's a couple of reasons why I never knew he was Muslim. Uh, because he was African American, number one, and the book said that Muslims were Arabs. And number two, I didn't know, you know, I thought Muslims ran around, you know, marrying as many women as they want and killing non-Muslims. I didn't know that they could also be part-time drug dealers. So I didn't know, I never knew that this guy was Muslim. I didn't put two and two together. So we were at his house one day. And me and my, my, my other friend, the one that, you know, I got into a lot of trouble with, I'm trying to keep him out of trouble now. Um, we were at his house and we were debating something about religion. I, for, I forget what even the topic was, but you know, you had two teenagers thinking they know everything. Um, and I was trying to explain something to him about the Bible. Uh, and that guy came in and, and was listening. He said, have you ever heard of Islam? I said, yes, I've heard all about Islam. <laughs> he was like, okay, so what do you think of it? I said, what do you mean what I think of it? That's probably the worst religion I've ever seen on the face of the planet. He's like, why? And he's like, but I'm a Muslim. I was like, man, stop playing. <laughs> you know, like, you're, you're, you're an African American. You know, he's like, so? I'm like, the book said you guys were Arab. They, all the, the Muslims were Arabs. He, and, and he was like, what else did you read in the book? And I told him, he was like, man, what in the, you know, what have you been reading? <laughs> he's like, you need to, 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 to go uh, to the mosque for Juma. He's like, I, he, he told me, he said, I'm not a good Muslim. This is what he said to me. He said, I'm not a good Muslim. I, I'm not even going to... Uh, try to front and say I'm a good Muslim. He said, but I can guide you to some people that can tell you the real truth about Islam uh, because he know about my story about wanting to find religion. And he said, you need to go to the mosque for Juma. And I said, what's, what's Juma? He said, it's just like church with no chairs. <laughs> and I said, I can do church with no chairs because in church the chairs were the worst part anyway. <laughs> Because they had these hard benches that you sit on that are like this, and they're so hard. I said, that's good that you sit on carpet? Wow, man, they should, every church should be like that. And uh, 
I said, where's the mosque? He said, it's on Whitehampton Boulevard. I said, where on Whitehampton Boulevard? I, I lived on Whitehampton Boulevard. I lived right off of Whitehampton Boulevard. He said, you know where Lee Road intersects with Whitehampton? I said, yeah, yeah. I, I live on the other side of that intersection. He said, it's right there. I said, no, it's not. There's nothing. There's a gas station or a church. He said, yeah, you know that church, the evangelical missionary training facility? I said, yeah, I used to take missionary classes there. He said, you know that building in, in the parking lot with the gold thing on top? I said, the, yeah, the gym? He was like, no, that's the mosque. Because I had always thought it was the gym because it was in the same parking lot and it was just rectangular with two glass doors in the front and you could literally walk in between the church and, and, and the masjid and touch them like this. Anyone doesn't believe me, go to Greenville, South Carolina, look at the masjid. You can almost touch the, both of them just like this. <clears throat> he said, yeah, it's right there. I said, I've never... You know, at first I was shocked, like I've been living across the street from all these crazy Muslims all my life. <laughs> you know, I said, I never knew. You know, and he told me to go to Juma, and I asked him what time. He, he said he would meet me there at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday. So I said, okay, I went on Friday. And I'm waiting outside for him. You know, I'm, I'm not going inside. That's not happening. Um, you know, and I'm seeing all these people going in. And at this time, it was a predominantly indo paki Arab uh, masjid. Anyone who went in even was, was not American, period. And I did not see even one uh, African American going there. And, and I did see one. And then when he went in, I heard him talking in a dialect that I realized was, he was probably from Africa. But I said, he's not American. Um, so I'm not going, I'm waiting and I'm standing outside sitting on the church steps and the Imam pulls up and parks right in front of me who I had no idea he was the Imam but he got out and he asked me, you know, am I, am I waiting for someone, this, that and the other and I explained to him, he said, oh yeah, we know this brother uh, you don't see him that, that, that much but we, we know who he is and, you know, he said, I'm glad you came, you know, he was a very, very nice, gentle young man um, and he invited me into the mosque and I kind of wanted to wait on my friend you know, but I didn't want, you know, at the same time, I didn't want to tell this man, I don't want to go in. So I went in, and they put me in the back and gave me a chair anyway. And I said, I came to sit on the floor. And they gave me a chair anyway, you know, and all of these people are piled up in front of me. And there's no Americans here. And I'm starting to wonder, you know, uh, if this is a setup. Because it's starting to smell like a setup to me. Because in my mind, I'm like, you've been set up before, and this, this seems kind of like this. So, and I'm starting to think in my head, you know, scenarios, you know, a young mind at play. You know, I said, this, this, this other guy, my friend, he probably was in the same situation like me, and he probably made a deal with them to get out as long as he brought <laughs> other Americans and tricked them into coming to the mosque so they could do their jihad after Juma and get their 70 virgins. <laughs> so I'm sitting here, and there's all these people in front of me, and then there's a curtain with all these people behind me making noise and I have no idea who's back here. So I'm stuck in the middle of this. I hear that it's some women, uh, but I don't, you know, I, there's a curtain. I have no idea. So I'm like, there's something very odd about what's going on right here. I'm like, just let me make it. I'm starting to look for the exit. I'm like, you know, calculating how many people are between me and the exit. You know, I, I, I know some martial arts. So I said, I might hit a couple of them and I'm out. And then the imam came, and I, I, I just now realized that he was the imam because he got up on the minbar, you know, and they, and they started to call the adhan. And, you know, I said, okay, that man seemed nice. He seemed genuinely nice. So I, I felt a little more comfort. And then he got up uh, uh, after the, the adhan, and he started his khutbah. Inna alhamdulillah nahmaruhu wa I said, oh my God. I said, I bet you he's talking about me. You know, and he's being forceful, you know, he was getting loud and banging on the member and he's pointing in my direction. You know, I'm like, oh man, I got to get out of here really quick, you know. I said, well, I'm going to take my chance with the women behind me. I'm going through the curtain. <laughs> and then he started to, when he got done with his Arabic tirade, um, he started to explain it. You know, uh, that verily all praise belongs to, to, to uh, Allah alone, or God alone, and, and Him do we worship, and Him do we seek help and assistance, we seek refuge with Him from the evil that lies. You know, He explained what He said in Arabic, and it sounded to me so beautiful. It was very, very beautifully prose, what He said, and I wanted to know where He got that. You know, I said, where did He get that? You know, because it was only about God, and, and, and about the nature of ourselves. All of us should, should know the, 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 that, that the beginning of the khutbah. And he quoted the, the three verses from the Qur'an, O you who believe, fear God as He should be feared and do not die. And instead of some, a state of submission to Islam, he was a very um, uh, wise man because he translated everything. It was almost as if he knew I was there and translated everything for me. You know, and, and he... I remember to this day what the khutbah was about. 
and I don't know if he did it because I was there or if that was his already planned khutbah but it's almost as if it was meant for me um, the khutbah was that the title of it was that the, the, the forgiveness of Allah is open to anyone at any time at any place uh, no matter what unless they have committed shirk and the, the, the prose of the, the khutbah was a very long hadith uh, a very long hadith that all, some of you will know um, and just to make it short, it was the hadith where the Rasulullah met Angel Gabriel or Angel Jibreel and Angel Jibreel was telling them to tell him that if the Muslims commit this certain sin to tell them that Allah would forgive them and every time he would tell the Muslims they would say okay well then what about this sin and he would go back and meet with Gabe, uh, Angel Jibreel and he would go back and come back and say tell him that Allah will forgive him for that and this discourse happened you know for many different sins and then finally Angel Jibreel alayhi salam said that tell them that Allah has said no matter what they do even if their sins are compiled, you know, like the, the, the oceans are from the east to the west, as long as they have not associated a part one with Allah, tell them that Allah will forgive them. And I remember he told me that, uh, or he said that, you know, that the door of repentance to God is open uh, as long as you have not seen the angel of death or the sun hasn't risen from the west. I, I didn't really understand the sun risen from the west thing at that time. But, um, and he said that, you know, God's forgiveness has to come from God alone. Uh, and he, this was the whole premise of his khutbah was on forgiveness and, and tawbah. And I was saying to myself, these are all of the same concepts that I had uh, formulated through reading the religious scriptures myself. And I'm asking myself, where did he get this stuff from? You know, where did he get all the... And he started using uh, names like, uh, he used the name Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, he used the name Musa. And I'm like, uh, he translated it to, to Abraham and Moses. I'm like, where did he... <laughs> You know, where is he getting these? These are names from the Bible. I know these people. And so after the, 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 the khutbah, they started lining up for the, for the prayer. And I got apprehensive because everybody's getting up in front of me and blocking my exit from the door. <laughs> and so I guess they, one, one guy in the back saw, saw me and he, because I had to move back a little bit, he said, we're about to pray. And I said, pray to who? And he said, to God. I said, which one? And he said, the, the one that created the heavens and earth, you know, the same one that's in the Bible, you know, the, the only creator of the heavens and earth, the only God. I said, yes, I, I, I know him. Um, and, the, and, and so the Imam started to pray, and I, when he recited the Quran, I know it sounded very intriguing. I had no idea what it was. Um, but then when I saw Muslims bow and prostrate on the floor, verses and verses of every religious book that I had ever read started ringing off in my head that this was the way men of God prayed and the first thing that I could think of in my mind was this is worship that's what I said to myself this is not prayer because prayers are asking God for something these people are worshiping God uh, so I said to myself that you've written this you've written this religion off way too easily I, I thought I was a much more open-minded person than that and I was ashamed of myself that I had written it off with just one little book. You know, I had put all these studies into the other religions. I read this one thing about Islam and was done. So I went uh, to the Imam after, the, after Jummah. I, I, you know, he talked to me. And I would have to say that I was probably a little bit rude with him. Um, and I've asked him to forgive me. The, you know, I saw him a few years later. I said, you got to forgive me for the first time you saw me. Because he started telling me, you know... Uh, would you like to know a little bit more? He, he had a very heavy accent. He was an Egyptian brother. Would you like to know a little bit more about Islam? He tried to give me some pamphlets. I said, no, 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 no. I, I, don't, I don't want any of this right here. I said, do you have a book? This is what I wanted to know. Do you have a book? Can you give me? He said, yes, we have a book. Uh, I, I said, it's called the Quran. I said, can I read it? Uh, uh, is it in English? Can I read it? He said, sure, you can read it. And then he tried to explain it to me a little bit how it came by. I said, nah, just give me the book because the book should speak for itself. Um, so I took the Qur'an home and on Friday night I started to read it because this is a book I had never seen before uh, and I was very interested so I, I went home and I opened this, opened the Qur'an and I read the Fatiha it seemed to me kind of like the Lord's Prayer you know, it was a little, little similar to what I found in the Bible um, but then I started to read Surah Al-Baqarah uh, I started to read Surah Al-Ali Imran and I started to see names that I had seen before I started to see names like Abraham Moses, David, Jesus, uh, Yahya, John the Baptist, Zechariah, Mary, and I said, I know all of these names, but there was something different about these people in this book. Uh, the prophets that I found in the Bible uh, were people that were deplorable, of, of not very character. 
These same men in the Qur'an were someone who were at the highest echelon of moral character and moral fiber. They were someone that was an example to be followed because they lived the message that they preached. Therefore, they were uh, able to be followed and emulated. So, I read all of these chapters and I, and I read the story of, of Jesus, uh, peace be upon him. Because when I saw the name Jesus first, I, that really intrigued me. I wanted to see what does this book have to say about Jesus. And I read the, the story in, 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 in Ali Imran, and I read the story in Surah Al Maryam. And it was so, it was, it was more beautiful than anything I had ever read in the New Testament or any, any nativity story that I had ever heard. It was more beautiful than that times ten. Uh, the, I remember the only thing that I could capture in my mind was the miracle of how. Uh, because in the Bible, you never really figure out the conflict of how Mary gets over this. this um, Point, finger pointing at her about her coming with a with a baby and she's not married. Uh, there's no real end to that. There's no real defense for her uh, from this in, in in the New Testament. But the Quran is so explicit and so clear that the Jesus' first miracle was to speak from the womb as a to speak as a baby and defend the honor of his mother. Something that you cannot deny. Something that you cannot deny about her who Mary was when you have this baby speaking on her behalf. So, I would say I read the Quran entirely in three days, but that first night after I had made it through Surah Al Ali Imran, my heart was already given to this book. I, I, I didn't know what it meant to be a Muslim, I didn't know how, how to be a Muslim, I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, but I knew that whoever it was that followed this book, I wanted to be like these people. Uh, I wanted to be like the people that I read about in this book. Uh, these were people I could follow, these were prophets, this was a book of guidance and this was something that the book is calling and appealing to me that if you don't believe in this book, you never see that, I've never seen this in any other scripture the direct challenges that are in the Quran that if you don't believe this book is true, put it to the test put it to the test and this was something that was so astounding to me that God is telling you over and over again, if you don't believe this is the truth Test it. Bring me something else like it. Test it. Put it to test. If it was written, if there was more than, I mean, all of the analogies about God, everything was so logical, so rational, so reasonable in my mind that it was like 2 plus 2 equals 4 and that was it. There was no 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 3, egg, yolk, water, fight. There was none of that foolishness. The Quran was very direct and very straightforward in its teachings. So I gave my heart to Islam. Uh, that night in, uh, in my living room reading the Quran and you know and I, I cried and cried you know that I had been looking for the truth all this time had searched all this way and it was right across the street right across the street from my house and so I went back on Monday uh, to accept Islam and ask these Muslims where in the world they've been all this time and I go ready to go in there and, and, and do my thing and I go and the masjid is locked and <laughs> Because there was, they only came on Fridays in for Isha uh, during that time, and I didn't know. Uh, so I said, okay, I, I guess I have to come back on, on Friday. Uh, because every time I passed by the masjid after that, it was always locked. So I came back on Friday, and I, and I took my shahada. You know, and as they say, the, you know, the rest is history. Um, but I don't travel around the world, and this was in December of 1998. Um, I don't travel around the country and the world telling my story you know, just for the entertainment value. Even though uh, I've been told it does have some entertainment value, I don't tell it for that person for for sure. If that was the only only reason, then you could just get it off of YouTube, and, and it was the same exact story. I'm going to finish with this, and I hope you can give me ten more minutes, inshallah, to, to to tell you why I go around telling my story. I tell my story to to let everyone realize that there are millions of millions and millions of people just like me, just like me in 1998 searching for the truth, can't find a way out. There are millions of people, there are probably millions of people in California, hundreds and thousands, if not millions, right here in, the, 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 in, in Orange County, in Los Angeles, in the Southern California area, that want to know the truth, that are tired of hearing the same garbage preached to them over and over again, tired of this uh, shaitan box telling them the same thing over and over again, tired of the world being in the condition that it's in, tired of their life, being in the condition it's in and we as Muslims have the solution to every single one of their problems and guess where we keep it at? right here inside the masjid 
right here inside the masjid we have all of this truth. We have the solution to every problem in the world. You want to solve the world hunger? Uh, the world hunger's pro the, the problem of world hunger? Islam has the problem. You want to solve the problem of world poverty? Islam has the answer. You want to fix the economic situation of this country? Islam could fix it tomorrow. And this was in an op-ed piece in the Washington Post. In the Washington Post there was an op-ed piece that, that the two markets that are falling apart in this country are investments and, 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 and housing. And there are two people in this market that while the, the rest are bottoming it out, this market is steadily climbing. It's not shooting, uh, getting rich overnight like people want to, but it is continually going up and that is Islamic financing and Islamic housing markets. These two things are so steady and so strong that uh, uh, Economists in, in DC are trying to figure out how they can take some of these Islamic principles some of these, from these investing and housing firms and plug them into this system to give it some stability because they realize that you won't get rich overnight in the Islamic system but it will be stable. It will be something that will give stability. So they are starting to find out that Islam has the answer and the solution to their problems but we already know this. We already know this that we can solve every world problem with Islam would put it into it but the problem is we're hiding it from the people unfortunately willingly or unwilling knowingly unknowingly we are hiding this from the people and there is a statement in the Quran and that, that Allah warns the Jews about what they did with their religion and it is a statement that is left in the Quran for us that verily those who conceal the evidences and the clear proofs after we have made it clear for them in the book they are those who are cursed by Allah and cursed by those who curse until and ex unless they, <clears throat> they repent and reveal that which they have been concealing. Those I will accept their repentance because I am the one who accepts it, the most merciful. We have become guilty just the same way the Jews have of hiding the truth about their religion. When they saw the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they knew the truth and wanted to hide it. People, we know the, we know the truth about Islam and we are hiding it. We as Muslims are running around begging Allah for dignity and honor and help when He has already given it to us in this deen. Everything that a Muslim could ever want has already been given to him in this deen of Islam. Anything that you ask Allah for, there is an account set up for you to go take it out of. You just got to find it where it's at. And any of you, I'm not going to go through the ayahs for they're too long, but if you want to know the solutions to every one of your problems in this world and the hereafter, just go read Surah Al-Saf, ayah 10 through 13. Very, very easy solution. If I had the time, I would read them to you, inshaAllah. But we have the cure to every disease in the world. And, and we're not giving it to the people. And I want to use this as a parable because I really want this to hit home with you. Uh, let's say, what is your name, brother? Abdullah. Abdullah, mashallah. Let's say me and Abdullah are, are, are best friends. We're brothers in deen. We're roommates. And we've been roommates for years and years and years. <clears throat> and let's say brother Abdullah has... Uh, contracts an illness, a disease that is one of the most painful diseases that any human being can ever ever go through in his life and it's not something that is going to kill him quick let's say this disease is going to suffer and fester with Abdullah and make him not be able to eat, sleep, nothing, he, he's just miserable all the time when I come home in the, in the evening he's rolling around on the floor in pain and, and let's say I know him in this condition and let's say one day I come across the cure for his disease someone tells me that if you give this to Abdullah or anyone like him, he will be instantly cured and, and he will never suffer again. Um, and let's say I take that and put it in my pocket and I don't give it to Abdullah. Why? Why don't you give it to Abdullah? Well, number one, I'm way too busy. I have two jobs, going to school, you know, I have a long commute back and forth, you know, I got to drive up and down the 405 every day. I don't have time to give Abdullah this medicine, man. If he wants the medicine, he'll go get it himself. I don't have time. I'm really busy. Number two, I'm not a doctor. I, I should not be prescribing Abdullah medicine, and I'm not knowledgeable in medicine. He should, if he wants help, he should go see a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Number three, Abdullah's, uh, please forgive me, but Abdullah's kind of stubborn. He doesn't really listen very well. He probably, he, you know, he's kind of set in his way. So even if I tell him this medicine is good for him and it'll cure him, he probably wouldn't even take it anyway. So why waste my time? Do any of these ex excuses sound familiar? And let's say I don't give this medicine to Abdullah and he dies. And let's say he dies the most painful death that you can ever imagine. 
I want to ask you a kind of rhetorical question. I want to ask you kind of a rhetorical question. Do you think on the day of judgment that um, Allah is going to call me and Abdullah up and ask him ab about this incident between me, him, and me and him because I've oppressed him? I have oppressed him. I've allowed him to suffer knowing that I could ease his suffering. I'm sure Allah is going to ask us about this. But you know the beauty about Islam is that if Abdullah was a good Muslim, bore this uh, disease patiently and died, he dies as a shaheed, uh, inshaAllah. And on the day of judgment, this is how beautiful Islam is, that he could very well come before and Allah ask us about this and Brother Abdullah say, you know what? Allah, I forgive him. So you forgive him. This is the beauty of our religion. And Allah, and Allah will forgive me. But the disease I want to tell you about is the disease that every single non-Muslim walks around with every single day and they don't even know it. It has, no, it has no real physical symptoms. And that's the disease of shirk. The disease of being jahl, being ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives them life and they worship someone else. Allah feeds them and they thank someone else. He created them and fashioned them in the womb of their mother and knows them better than they know themselves. And they have no idea who He is. They don't even know who He is. If that doesn't pain your heart to see a person in this condition, then, then, then for sure the hearts have become hardened. Because when I see non-Muslims, especially when I sit in places like airports, I see this disease. I see it on them. I see them walking around with it. And there's so many of them passing me, I think to myself, there's no way I could talk to all of them. There's nothing I can do. And this disease is something that not only is not going to show up as a physical symptom, and is going to leave them ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when the day they die, they will die the most physically painful death that anyone can ever suffer. The Rasulullah said that when the angel of death comes to the disbeliever, it doesn't come kindly. He yanks the soul through the nose and it's as if he, he, his flesh is torn from his bones. It's as if they take Brother Abdullah and turn him upside down and stuff him in a human paper shredder. This is the death that is waiting for those who do not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know the unfortunate thing? That while you've been sitting here listening to me, thousands of people have died. Thousands of people have lost their life not knowing Allah while I'm talking to you right now. People in this city have lost their life and there's nothing we can do about them. They're gone. It's too late for them. We can't save them even if we want to. And that's a deplorable, deplorable, sad, sad fact that we can't save them. But there are many, 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 many who we can save. And that all that takes is us taking this light of Islam we have and showing it to the world. There's a statement in the Bible and I finish with this, whether Jesus uh, said this or not, doesn't matter because this statement is one of the most profound statements that has, has been somewhat of a, a focus for me in my mission of da'wah. Uh, it is said that no one would bring a candle into his home and then place a bucket on top of it because then no one would benefit from the light. No, if someone would bring a candle to their home, they would set it on the table in the middle of the room so that everyone could benefit from this light. And unfortunately, the Muslims of this generation, we are a bunch of candles with buckets on top of it. No one can see our light. No one can see the beauty of Islam. And believe me, if you don't see it, believe me, take it from someone who was once standing on the outside looking through the window at that light. It is one of the most beautiful things you can ever lay your eyes on. It is a treasure to be found of treasures. And everyone else can see this and they will see this if we show it to them. If we allow Islam to be Islam, if we start becoming Muslims, meaning that we, the best form of da'wah that you can do to this world is very, very simple. It's not complex. It doesn't take a 10 hour workshop, even though some of the details do. But if you want to know the way, the best way to be, uh, do da'wah is for Muslims to be Muslims. That's it. Study our history. Study the history of Islam. Why was the world conquered by Islam? Not through military campaigns and wars, but through Muslims being Muslims. The most populated Muslim country, Indonesia, was because of Muslims being Muslims. A few Muslims deciding to get up off their behinds and go to another country and live their life as Muslims, not shaving off their deen to be pleasing to those people, but being Muslims. And when the people asked them and inquired, what is it about you backwards Arabs that we've heard all these crazy things about, now you come out of the desert 
with pristine moral and character and, and you're, you have better ethics and morals than we do. What is it that's happened to you people? And their answer was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah that we believe in Allah and He has sent us a man named Muhammad and we emulate his lifestyle. That's why we're like this. This is what conquered the world for Islam. This is what conquered people's hearts for Islam was the truth and the beauty of it and its simplicity of its message. This is what brought me and this is what the world needs. With all of this foolishness going on in the world, this is what it needs, the simplicity of Islam. Whether they want to hear it or not, they know it in the bottom of their heart when you show them the truth, even if they turn away from it, they know it's the right thing. They know it's the truth. And on the Day of Judgment, you can stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having washed your hands and saying that I did my job and I finished just one more thing, I finished with this if you don't believe this is important if you don't believe this is one of the most important things you can do as a Muslim um, then the last statement of Prophet Muhammad to the Muslims as a whole, he gave his farewell sermon and we know that his, what his farewell sermon was, was a summary or a synopsis of what Islam is and its general principles and he knew this was the last thing he was going to say to the Muslims as a whole and how did he end this sermon? those who are here Pass this on to those that are not here. For verily it may be that the last one that hears my message may understand it than those right here among us. He gave a command to those Muslims to pass it on and for those Muslims to pass it on and for those Muslims to pass it on until there was no one left to hear this message. This was a command he gave, the last command he gave to this ummah as a whole. And then what happened? He pointed his finger to the heavens and said, O Allah, bear witness that I have indeed conveyed your message. And upon saying this, what happened? Allah revealed the surah, This day I have perfected for you your deen and completed my favor for you and chose for you Islam is your religion. And the last statement that Prophet Muhammad gave to us before this was revealed was that we must pass this message on. He gave us that duty. He took that duty that was only reserved for prophets. No one else, no other if you don't believe me, go read Surah al bayna about what was uh, commanded of the other nations. No other nation was given this opportunity and blessing to pass on this deen except us. Because there are no more prophets coming. So the, the job falls on our shoulders. Qurans are not going to fall out of the sky and hit people when they're walking down the street. This job has now become ours. And just like if the Prophet Muhammad had not done his mission, he would have been accountable before Allah. We, if we do not do our job of spreading this message of Islam, we will stand before Allah on the Day of Judgment. Don't be the person standing before Allah on the Day of Judgment and your neighbor that you've known, your co-worker that you've known 15, 10, 15, 20 years come and find you and tell you, you knew this day was coming. You knew this day was coming and what was going to happen to me and you did not say anything to me. And those people will complain to Allah about us. They will complain to Allah about us. Because we have the truth right amongst them and we're not giving it to them. We need to stop hiding it in our masjids, in our homes, in our hearts and we need to give it to the people. It's beautiful, trust me. Just hand it to them. Just hand it to them. I promise you they'll take it because it's something that is so pure and pristine. And now forgive me for probably going over my time and if we have time I want to leave some time for questions and answers. Um, I just, and I will be outside to take any questions and answers. Uh, the only last thing I want to uh, announce and let you brothers and sisters know is um, one of my big, big, biggest da'wah projects is a DVD project that I do. And my goal is to put a DVD about Islam in the hands of every single uh, uh, person in the United States of America. Uh, right now I'm working on Florida and other, I have other brothers working in other places. Uh, because people will watch a DVD. We did studies on this and people will watch media they, before they'll read a book or before they'll listen to an audio CD. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, through these DVDs we've gotten, uh, I would say, an average of about two shahadas a month uh, because my personal contact info is on the DVDs and people watch them and they call me and I converse with them and, and usually they, and most of them accept Islam. Um, I just had a shahada the day before yesterday from Irvine, Texas, from someone who had bought the DVD and given it, a Muslim had bought it, gave it to his friend, his friend hated it or didn't want it so he gave it to another person and that person gave it to a co-worker at work who watched it and accepted Islam. Um, so this is one of my biggest projects and the way this project works is I make a hundred DVDs and I brought two of them with me today, I'm going to explain what they are. The way this project works is I make a hundred DVDs and 75 of them go out uh, to different da'wah uh, arenas and the other 25 I make available for Muslims to purchase for two reasons so that they can be uh, so that I can buy another hundred to make and so that you can share in this ajr along with me because when you 
purchase a DVD that makes another DVD or you give it to a friend then you share in this ajr with me and everyone knows that Dawah is the biggest pyramid system because of the Hadith Rasulullah that one who uh, calls to guidance is, gets the same reward as the one guided without that reward being lost from him so um, I, I make these DVDs available to the to the Muslims so that you can put a little effort in Dawah and, 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 and make another hundred inshallah so I brought two today and they're outside um, one of them is called Islam in the Bible which is basically my what I just told you in a PowerPoint format so that you could see all these verses that I saw all these things that I read that allowed me to see the truth of Islam very clearly when I saw it and I coincide them with the Quran so that you could see them and there's another one um, called the other one's called the true gospel of Jesus Christ where I go through the New Testament well first part I think is an interview about me um, and my story to Islam and there's some other Q&A's on the other DVDs about nature of God and all these different things but um, it's a PowerPoint presentation about the New Testament and Jesus Christ and how you can prove to someone that Jesus Christ taught Islam from the New Testament from their own book that they have to agree they either have to believe it or reject it and if you believe it then you have to believe what I'm saying is true about Islam if you reject it then this is your book not mine so you know the, I try to use these two teaching methods um, and they, they also can be given to non-Muslims because they're in a PowerPoint format, they're in a very educated format and they're available outside for uh, $10 each. Um, so if you, please, if you could please don't make me take any of them back home because they always hassle me about taking 200 DVDs on an airplane anyway. Um, so please come and get them and if you have any questions, uh, my contact info is on there and, and everything if you have any more questions for me and my website and everything. I thank you for your time and if anything has been of benefit, know that truly all good comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if anything that I have said is incorrect uh, or, or, or hurtful or, or shameful, know that, that indeed that comes from, from my own nafs and my own lack of understanding. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.